Reformed Church. Today is going to be definitely a continuation from, from last week, and I know that each week has been a continuation from the week before because we've been doing this for like six or seven, I think it's seven parts already, um, that we've been doing the Chase Me series. It is very important, though, to today that you understand last week's message. And the reason why I say that is because last week, I took time to do things I don't ordinarily do, and we just went through and defined a whole bunch of terms. Um, some of the terms I actually wrote on this side of the dry erase board. Um, but uh, we went through and defined a whole bunch of terms that we're going to use today again, and I'm not going to go over those terms again. So today, if you haven't heard last week's message for right now, you're just going to have to take my word for it that these terms mean this. But the substantiation and the scriptural evidence for these things were given uh, last week, and I think a good amount of scriptural evidence as well to define terms. Just so you know, uh, when we get into symbols and stuff, if you'll notice, when I give you guys a symbol or when I give you, um, when I'm defining a word, I really try to give you a lot of scripture for it. Uh, don't, don't quickly define words in the Bible, because if you define a word wrong, then every time you read that word, you're going to be reading it wrong. So, so don't, don't be quick to jump the gun with, with symbols and stuff. In fact, if you just don't understand how to explain a certain symbolic passage in the Bible very well, if you don't know it front to back, if you don't feel like super comfortable with it and it doesn't seem super easy to you, then just don't get into it because I've heard so many people teach on quote-unquote biblical symbols, and I know it's wrong. Like, I, I, I know it's wrong. It's, it's completely contrary to Christ. Some of the things that people have said, um, I believe that the Bible says throughout it, right? The Bible explains very clearly that, um, especially when it comes to the Old Testament, that these things are symbolic of Jesus, Right? The Old Testament is historically accurate, but it's also symbolic of Jesus. And that's why even uh, last week we talked about from, let me get the verse for you, from 1 Peter 3.20. You can probably throw that up there. 1 Peter 3.20. I may not read that first, but just in case. Um, and actually it's verse 21, 1 Peter 3.21. He basically, Peter says that, Noah and the account of the flood and everything is a symbol of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what we explained last week, all right? So I'm not going to get into that, but you'll even see here in, uh, in verse 20, it says, the like figure whereunto even baptism does now save us. But you see where it says figure there? That's talking about a symbol, a figure, like a figure of speech. And in the previous verse, he was just talking about Noah and the flood. And so he says, Noah and the flood, he, he speaks about how Noah and his family were saved by water. And it says that that's a figure. What Peter's doing there is he's saying that it's symbolic. So when you hear me talk about symbols and things like that in the Bible, don't think that that's sort of like my slant on something or something that I'm just sort of doing with the passage. And you, you, you may think like uh, almost, some people may think that the, the Bible's maybe not meant to be used that way, where, where you have, see all these symbols of Jesus. But it's very clear in the Bible, even when, when in the book of Colossians, where Paul talks about, uh, all these, you know, Sabbath days and new moon festivals and all these things. He said these things are shadows, but the reality or the body is of Christ. That basically means that there are symbols that God gave all through the Old Testament, but the reality is Jesus. So uh, it's important to understand that seeing symbols in the Bible is, that's biblical precedent, okay? Uh, the Bible lays out uh, very clearly the fact that the Old Testament especially, and even in the New Testament, that things are symbolic of Jesus, Okay, so I just want to mention that. Um, let me read this to you. If you can just throw, I just, I just want to breeze through this. Uh, Proverbs 8, 1. Proverbs 8, 1. Um, let's just review real quick. This will be relevant in a second. And you know what? I'm going to, is it better if I move this over here? Do you think you'd be able to see this better? If I move, if I, yeah? How about you? Can you see that? Okay, from there? And you guys can see that back, back there? Okay. So, yeah, if I move this, then you're not going to be able to see it at all. So, okay. So, all right, so I'll leave that there. But you guys know, I'm not have to, I don't have to review this very much. You understand, right, the parallels that we were giving here with, the, with the, um, uh, the veil and the door, right? And how basically, essentially, what we've been saying is that there is a door to heaven, right? And Jesus' sacrifice for us, or the, rather, more specifically, the righteousness that we receive through Jesus' sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice is called the veil in Hebrews 10. It's called the door in a lot of verses, but specifically in, um, in John 10. Um, and 
That's why I put the references up there for you, if you need the, the references that, for, for these parallels, that, at least the main ones. And what we've been saying is that the Bible explains, again, this is what we've been speaking about the whole series, right? So I'm not going to explain it right now, but that through Jesus' death, we can enter heaven. The Bible says that very clearly. Through Jesus' death, we can enter heaven. Um, and that is in, in Hebrews 10. And actually, no, sorry, I know we're bouncing around right now, but if you can throw up uh, Hebrews 10, verse, uh, verse 19. And that, that explains in Hebrews 10, 19, that it says that we, with boldness, uh, we have the power, we have the ability to enter what Hebrews calls the holiest, right? And that is one of the easier verses to show that the Bible says that we can enter heaven, all right? That Jesus has already entered the high heavens. We've been through that, right? After Jesus died, Jesus died, and then he entered the high heavens. The high heavens, by that I mean where the Father is. Jesus was glorified, made in the image of the high heavens first in his glorification. Then he ascended to the Father, and he entered the high heavens. And the, what the Bible teaches is that we're able to follow Jesus into the high heavens. And no, I don't mean after you die. What I mean, this is what we're going to explain tonight, is how that works. But uh, it says, the Bible says that we can enter into heaven. Right? It says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. And if you read Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9 explains that the holiest means heaven. Right? We, we went through that. Hebrews chapter 9 defines that word holiest as meaning heaven. Okay, the holiest doesn't mean the presence of God. The holiest means heaven. So if you flip that word, it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the heavens. Or enter, not the heavens, plural, but into heaven. If the holiest means heaven, then we have boldness to enter into heaven. And this is present tense. We went over that also. This verse is present tense. And all the other verses that we've been through as well. Um, to show that Jesus' death like when Jesus died, right, the veil was torn. The veil was torn and exposing the holiest. And that's a picture of how Jesus' death or the righteousness that we receive through Jesus' death qualifies us to be able to enter heaven now. And that's why this verse says that we have boldness to enter into heaven by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, that's the door, right? Because the veil represents his flesh. If you can go to the next verse, you'll see the veil represents Jesus' flesh, right? It says by a new and living way, uh, through the veil, that is to say his flesh, so, right, I'm not making any of that up. It says we can enter heaven, or the holiest, right? But better said, we can enter heaven through Jesus' blood and through his flesh, or the veil, okay? So, all in all, to say this plainly, this verse is telling us that you can enter heaven. What, which heaven? The heaven where Jesus went. And you can enter the things that Jesus entered through his death. That's what we've been explaining this entire series. Here's the problem, though, is that that sounds a little bit weird because this is talking present tense. You can go back to verse 19. This is talking about present tense, that you have, present tense, boldness to enter heaven. This is not talking about one day you can enter heaven. This is talking about right now you can enter heaven. And you can enter heaven, why? Because Jesus died so that you could enter heaven. But that sounds obviously weird to people if you don't understand how that works. It sounds weird at first to, what does that mean that I can enter heaven? And I'm going to just say this again, that's not disputable, okay? That is what this, this verse in verse 19 here, Hebrews 10, 19, that's what this is saying. Okay, I, I've, I've said this throughout the, the series. You and I do not have the power, the ability, or the right to define biblical words the way we want to define them, right? If the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, it says that Jesus has not entered into the holiest made with hands, but into heaven itself. I'm going to say that one more time. Hebrews chapter 9 says that Jesus has not entered into the holiest, or hagion, made with hands, but into heaven itself. It defines the holiest as heaven itself. So when we read this verse, you cannot say that this means simply that we have boldness to enter the presence of God. Because God doesn't define the holiest as the presence of God. Give me the verse, and I only say that sarcastically because I know there's not that verse, but give me the verse where the, the Bible says that Jesus entering into the holiest represents him entering the presence of God. You won't find it because there's not a verse that defines the word holiest as the presence of God. The word holiest means heaven. And if it means heaven, then when it, the, whenever the Bible says the word holiest, you have to see that as being heaven. And it says you have boldness to enter into heaven. How can we enter heaven though? Furthermore, John 10 explains, it doesn't say the holiest, but it says the upper fold, right? In not so many words. It says that you can climb up into the, or, or, or in other words, that there is a fold that is up. I'll say that much, right? You can cl climb up into this fold that Jesus climbed, climbed up into, all right? Uh, there's something with that word up that we're going to go over today that we don't actually climb up to get to the fold, but this fold um, is up. And it says that Jesus entered this fold that is up. He ascended into this fold, and it says, and the sheep can follow Jesus there. 
So again, it's saying this, this fold represents heaven. And we've been through that in the past messages. But what, what, what that's saying is that where Jesus went, which is heaven, that upper fold, the sheep can also go there as well. So you've got over here, you've got Hebrews saying you can enter the holiest or heaven. And then over here, you've got it saying the sheep can enter this upper fold, which is heaven. So, okay, so you've got all these verses that symbolically are talking about where Jesus went into the high heavens. Where Jesus went, just so you know, there are different levels of the heavens as we've been, as we've been through, and Jesus went to the highest one. God dwells in the highest heaven. That is not the only heaven. There are different levels of the heavens, okay? And there's the highest heaven where the Father is, and that's why when the angels gave praise to God when Jesus was born, they said glory to God in the highest. That's what's meant by that. He is in the highest heavens, okay? Uh, furthermore, Solomon, when he was building the, uh, the temple, you don't have to put this up, but 1 Kings 8, 27 says, when Solomon built the temple, it says, but will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of the heavens cannot contain thee. You see the different heavens? He said about God that, God, the heavens and the heaven of the heavens can't contain thee. And so you see the different levels of the heavens, right? Um, with all that said, Jesus entered into the high heavens, or you could say the shepherd entered into the upper fold, right? That's where our shepherd Jesus has ascended to, into the upper fold. That basically means that Jesus entered into heaven. But John 10 says that the sheep can also go there. That's us. This is what it's saying in, in simplicity, okay? So if you haven't understood anything I've said so far, that's okay. We take this a step at a time. I'm going to say it simply, though. This is saying that just the way that Jesus entered into the highest heaven where the Father is, you, right now, because this is present tense when it says that we have boldness to enter the holy. That's present tense. You, right now, can enter the same high heavens that Jesus entered into in his resurrection and ascension. I'm going to repeat that one more time so everyone understands the baseline. Even if you don't get all the symbols, that's okay right now. Listen to this series over and over and over again, okay? And then you'll get the symbols better. Um, but this is the, the basic understanding of this. These two passages, the, the conclusion of these two passages and of this entire series we've been going over so far is that the same, listen closely, the same high heavens where Jesus ascended to, you can also enter now. Now. Sitting in your seats right now, you can enter today, right now. You can enter those things without ascending. I'll add that little bonus piece. Without ascending. Jesus had to ascend into heaven, right? And he entered into the high heavens. You can enter the high heavens now without ascending. Okay? And this is, so, so now we have that baseline sort of there. Put that on the shelf now. Now we're going over to the book of Genesis. Okay? Again, listen to last week's message because that is all the groundwork for this. All right. We're going over to Genesis now, and uh, I'm going to flip this. And this is our sort of chart for the book of Genesis, chapter 6, I believe. Not going to bring you here again. I just showed you that verse very briefly, but in 1 Peter 3, that's where Peter states, not me, Peter, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Peter says that the whole account of Noah and the flood is a picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? Okay. You will see this relevance to what we were just saying before about us being able to enter the high heavens. You'll see that relevance in a moment, okay? But we're going to take a break from that. So we're, we're, let's pause, and we're going to read the account in Genesis, and we're going to make some more points because I did not get to finish my points last week, all right? Okay, so if you want that verse, that's 1 Peter 3. It explains that Noah, this is specifically what it says, Noah and his family were saved by water. As I said last time, you realize, right, that when Noah, you know the account, right, with Noah and the ark? Noah, physically speaking, historically speaking, Noah built an ark to be saved from the water, right? The water potentially would have killed Noah and his family. Potentially, right? Would have killed Noah and his family, which obviously is why he built the ark. It's to save him and his family and all the animals, clean and unclean animals, correct? Noah built a big boat. The word ark, just so you know, doesn't mean boat. It, I believe it means like box, um, referring more to like a vessel than, than a boat. But uh, Noah built this vessel. And he built it to be saved from the water, right? To be saved from the water. Well, 1 Peter 3 says, well, actually, uh, Noah and his family going into the ark and the flood and everything, that's a symbol of how the Holy Spirit baptized us, which we're going to go over in a second. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, basically, that just means when you receive the Holy Spirit for the first time. Okay? Um, that's what this is a symbol of. 
And it says that they were saved by the water. Think, let's think about this for a second. It says that Noah and his family was saved by water. Saved by the water. Now, you know this is symbolic. And just follow me with this, okay? You know this is symbolic. Because in reality, and historically, Noah wasn't saved by the water. Noah was saved from the water. It was the water that was the threat to him. Correct? Everyone follow me? The water was the threat. Here it actually says it was, he, he's, he's, what he's saying is that it's the water that saved Noah. Say, so, well, what do you mean by that? Well, it's symbolic. I'm not saying in reality, physically speaking, the water actually saved Noah. He was being saved from the water, right? By the ark. But if you read it symbolically, don't read it just for the account that it is historically, and it is historically accurate, okay? This flood really happened. But it is also symbolic of Jesus, as with everything in the Old Testament. Jesus said, it's these, speaking about the Old Testament, that testifies of me. Jesus said that. So you can't just read the, the, the account of Noah and think it's just about Noah. No, Jesus said that's about him. So let's find out together how this account is about Jesus, because that's why you come to Reformed Church and why you should be going to any church, is because you want to hear about what Jesus did for you, right? So if you come to church and you, like, like unfortunately, kids' church today, you'll send your kids into the children's ministry and they're just going to learn about Noah and how God keeps his promises. What does that have to do with Jesus? Jesus said that testifies of him. God keeping his promises is great and all. That's not about Jesus, though. We need to be teaching something a little more substantial than God keeps his promises. And you may be offended by that because you may, well, it's true, isn't it, that God keeps his promises? Sure, but God could keep his promises and have never sent Christ. Your job as a, as a minister of, of the gospel is not to teach God keeps his promises. The mark of a good teacher is someone that confesses Christ having come in the flesh. That's the book of 1 John for you. That is the mark of the Holy Spirit preaching, is teaching Jesus. Not teaching God keeps his promises. Now, if you want to say God kept his promise, he said he was going to send Jesus, and he did, that's great. Now we're teaching Jesus. But if you will teach, this is going to probably offend some people, if you teach the book of Genesis and the account of Noah as simply and merely, look, when God says something, he does it. No one, you couldn't have gotten saved off of that knowledge. You need knowledge of Jesus to get saved. And again, God can be faithful to his word without having ever sent Christ. You need, our jobs as ministers of the gospel is to teach Jesus. Not even to just teach God. You believe in God? Great. Believe also in Christ. It's not good enough to say God. The Bible actually says that if you deny the Son, you also deny the Father. But if you accept the Son, you have the Father also. So it's not about leaving God out. It's that God has made his son central, not himself. His son is central. And I'm not leaving God out. God is not self-revealed. He's revealed by his son. Your job as a minister is not to talk about Noah built a boat and saved all the animals. And look, God sent a little rainbow because he always keeps his word. No one get, could, could have gotten saved off of that, and no one can bear fruit by that. That is what you would call not according to Christ. And the Bible says that people are cheated and robbed of the fruit that they could be seeing in their life when they hear things that are not according to Christ. And God keeps his promises, if that's where you stop, is not according to Christ. Because most kids that we send off into our children, thank God, not here in this church. You got Miss Kim upstairs and Miss Tammy, and you got a, a bunch of great teachers teaching your kids about what Jesus finished for them. And guess what? Sometimes we might use the, the book of Noah, but you better be darn sure that they're not going to leave with simply God keeps his promises and Noah saved all the animals, because that doesn't help anybody. They're going to come out knowing something that Jesus finished for them. That's according to Christ, and just so you know, as much as you may be offended by that, that's the mark that the Bible says is the mark of a good teacher, and the mark of the Holy Spirit is when someone teaches Christ having come in the flesh. So anyway, that's, that's, that's important to note. So Noah is pointing to Jesus, and that's what we're doing here. We're seeing how it testifies of Christ. Let's go over the symbols really quick. Mountain or a hill uh, means, or, or cliff, that's not relevant for today though. Mountain or hill, that means heaven. Okay, we went over all, how, we went over last week how the Bible defines these words. Okay, so these are not my definitions, they're, they're God's definitions. Mountain means heaven. Ark is referring to a body. Okay, we went over that as well. So the ark, that boat, represents the body of Christ as a whole. All right, and it said, well, we'll get to that in a second. Ark represents a body. Water, in this case, represents the Holy Spirit, all right? Uh, uh, 
Water can represent different things, but in this case, it's representing the Holy Spirit. That's why in 1 Peter 3, he said they were saved by the water, and that's a symbol of baptism, specifically the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you know that the waters of the flood from 1 Peter chapter 3, he says that's a picture of the Holy Spirit's baptism. And also the clean and unclean animals that go into the ark are represented, uh, representations of, of Jews and Gentiles. Okay? Clean and unclean animals. Cleans would be the Jews, unclean would be the Gentiles. Okay? Uh, isn't it interesting, too, that the Bible says to Noah to bring in clean and unclean animals, right? Well, the law wasn't even given yet. The law wasn't given until thousands of years later in which God instituted what was a clean animal and what was an unclean animal. So I, I'm curious as to what that even means at the time, but we do know what it means symbolically and why God wrote that, because clean and unclean animals represents Jews and Gentiles. Okay? So with all that said, Noah is a picture of Jesus. All right? Noah is a picture of Jesus because, remember, the ark is a picture of a body. And who built the ark? Noah. There's a kid's song about that. Who built the ark? Noah, Noah. Well, who built the ark? Noah. Well, the ark is a representation of what? The body of Christ. Who builds up the body of Christ? In other words, who adds people to the body of Christ? Jesus does, right? Just the way that Solomon, the quote-unquote son of David, built up a temple for God. He's a picture of Jesus building up a temple. Jesus uh, builds his church. Every time someone gets saved, Jesus puts his spirit inside that person, and now they're another part. They're another abode. They're another dwelling place or another room in the house of God. We said this last time too, but each one of us in here, if you are saved, each one of us, God lives in each one of us, right, inside of our bodies. This was prophesied. God lives inside of you, which means that you are a house for God, right, individually. But we also, because we're a house for the same spirit, we make up one household for God. That's why you'll remember in John, I think it's chapter 14, Jesus says, in my Father's house, that's the body of Christ, like the ark, in my Father's house, there are many mansions, right? That word mansions, just so you know, doesn't mean like a really nice house. You know, because the word mansion, that's how we use it in modern English. In old English, just so you know, this is why it's so commonly misconstrued what that verse means. In old English, the word like mansiones or something like that, I forget what, what, exactly how you, how you pronounce it, but the word mansion just meant a house, like in old English. That word is abode. In fact, later on in that same chapter, Jesus says, me and my father, pay close attention to this, Later on in that same chapter, Jesus says, me and my Father will make our abode in you. You guys remember that verse? Me and my Father will make our abode in you. That word abode is the same word as mansions earlier. Same exact word. So that's not a good modern translation to say, in my Father's house there are many mansions. People usually translate that or, or, or interpret that to mean in heaven, which heaven is not God's house. We are. But they think that my Father's house means heaven, and in my Father's house, meaning so-called heaven, there are many mansions, like Jesus is going to build us all mansions in heaven. That's, that's not what I mean. The word doesn't mean mansions. It just means a dwelling place, and the Father's house is us. In God's house, in other words, in the body of Christ, there are many dwelling places. We are those dwelling places. And guess what? In the ark, when Noah built the ark, there were many, the Bible said there were many rooms in the ark. So you see the symbolism there. When Jesus said, in my Father's house, in other words, in my body as a whole, the body of Christ as a whole, in the church, there are many dwelling places. And, and, and I want to make you one of those dwelling places, right? That's what Jesus said. Uh, well, in, 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 in the, the symbolism here, Noah builds an ark in which there are many rooms, like the many dwelling places of the household of God, right? That, that's what that's, that's, what, that's uh, symbolizing. The way the Lord put it to me was uh, uh, that Noah is the, uh, or Jesus is the architect, Jesus is the architect, but he said it to me like A-R-K, architect, right? He's the builder of the ark. Jesus is that to us. He's the architect. That sounds like a subtitle. We'll see if that ends up being the subtitle for this message. But Jesus builds up the ark, and uh, that's what that ark is a symbol of. It's a symbol of the body of Christ, okay? The water, again, of the flood we said is a spirit, and we already went over the Jews and Gentiles and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so, so let, let, let's, let's get to reading this. Um, I'm not going to have to read as much because we read a lot last time, but I kind of want to pick up where we left off. So he, he, let, let's picture this for a second, okay? Noah and his family represent us. The animals, clean and unclean, represent both Jews and Gentiles. And all of them go into the ark. So what does that mean? That means that Jesus is a part of the house of God. Or you could say Noah is a part of the ark. In fact, Noah is the, Pastor Jose pointed this out to me uh, after the message last time, uh, 
Noah was the first one to enter the ark. It says, it says, Noah went in and his family. So Jesus is actually, and it is true biblically, Jesus is the first to be a part of the household of God. And all of us, his family, are now built up into the ark, made into separate rooms in the ark. Remember, this is symbolic. Forget, we're not talking about what this is literally or historically. We're talking about symbolically. So when Noah goes into the ark, it's like Jesus being built up into the ark. And who's a, who, who goes into the ark? Noah and his families, that's Jesus and us. Uh, and clean and unclean animals, and both male and female. That means there's no discrimination with God. Salvation is for everybody. Everybody can be a part of the household of God. Male and female, and just so you know, male and female uh, may have different roles in a household. That is true, just so you know. A male and a female, once they get married, have different roles in a household. But a male and a female, just in general, before God, God doesn't use one more than the other or anything like that. Okay, the Bible says your sons and your daughters will prophesy, right? All that is good stuff, prophesied in the book of Joel. Male and female, both equally built up into the house of God. That's not politically correct, that's just correct. Okay, that's just the gospel. And also clean and unclean animals. What does that mean? Both Jews and Gentiles all get built up into the ark, or all can get built up into the household of God. And how does that happen? How do we become a part of the ark? How, obviously, what I'm talking about is the body of Christ. How do we become a part of the body of Christ? Well, you know, obviously, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, came inside of you, and what happened? When the Holy Spirit came down from heaven and came inside of you, that's the, just so you know, that's called baptism. I, you listen to our baptism teaching on Reform You, but uh, this is biblically verified. The first time you receive the Holy Spirit is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's when the Holy Spirit indwells you for the first time, when you were saved. When the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you, what are you now? You are now a dwelling place for God as a part of his whole household or his whole, entire ark. Right? So what are we saying here? That the Holy Spirit or the water had to come down first and indwell you. And when the water came down from heaven and indwelt you, or you could say when the flood came down from heaven, you hear me? When the flood came down from heaven and indwelt us, it's the flood waters that is what built us into that, the ark. Right? So the flood water came down from heaven. And just so you know, uh, uh, again, the Holy Spirit is referred to as water in, for instance, John chapter 7. He's referred to as rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit is referred to as living water in John chapter 7. So this living water descended out of heaven to us, indwelt us, and from that moment, that's how God built you into his ark, or built you into his full household. You became a room in the ark. You became a, quote unquote, mansion in the household of God, if you want to say it in old English, right, or, or, or a, a dwelling place in the household of God. Just so you know, there's a new translation out called the, the literal version, uh, which in, in John chapter 14, it doesn't say mansion. It says, it says rooms. It says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. And that's actually a Bible translation that just came out last year. I haven't had, obviously, a lot of experience with it, but it seems pretty good. It seems very much like the Young's literal translation. In that translation, it says it right. Instead of saying mansions, which is not modern English, um, it says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. Just like Noah could say, in my ark, there are many rooms. Right? Okay, so all that said, that's how we became a part of the household of God, or the ark, you could say, is that the Holy Spirit, the floodwaters came down from heaven, indwelt us, and boom, from that moment, you, are, you became a part of the household of God, a room in the ark. Okay, so let's look at Genesis chapter... seven, and we're going to pick it up here. So just read along with me, just so you don't get distracted, because I know that sometimes when you're not making a point specifically, it, you know, you can be prone to get distracted. So if you read along with me, though, it'll keep you from getting distracted, because we're going to read a little bit. So uh, Genesis chapter 7, uh, verse 1. Genesis 7, 1. And it says, uh, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all your house into the ark. For you I have seen righteous before me in this generation, and of every clean beast you shall take to thee by sevens, uh, the male and his female. So he's talking about clean beasts right now. So he's saying Jews, both male and female. You see that? Clean beasts. Again, we, we said from uh, the book of Acts, clean beasts and unclean beasts were refer, be, being referred to as Jews and Gentiles um, to Peter in the book of Acts. So he says, of every clean beast you shall take to thee by sevens. I don't know what the number seven there means. I'm sure it's important, obviously. But uh, it says the male and his female. So male and his female um, uh, of Jews. And beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Uh, verse 4. Go to verse 4. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights. Verse 6. Let's just skip to verse 6 for time. 
And this is, this is what I pointed out last time. Listen closely. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in. Look at this. And Noah went in and his sons and his, and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. I pointed this out last time. I just want to point it out one more time just so that we can review this because it's worth saying again. I, I want to hear this again. That physically speaking, I love the fact that physically speaking, Noah obviously had to go into the boat before the flood came, right? Like, otherwise, what would be the point of the, the boat if the flood was going to come and Noah was going to have to swim over to the boat or something, right? That's obviously not how it happened. Noah went into the boat first, or the ark first, and then the rain came down and the floodwaters, you know, consumed the earth. But look at verse 6. Uh, excuse me, yeah, 6. God mentions the water first and says the, that Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. You see? It says, it says Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, verse 7, and Noah went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Look at that. Because of the waters of the flood. What, what did we say that caused you to be a part of the household of God? The Holy Spirit, right? The baptism of the Holy Spirit caused you to be a part of the household of God. Here it says... Again, we're reading this symbolically. This is not how it happened historically. But God, listen, God puts the historic account and puts the words just so, so that you can read it. If you understand what water means, if you know it means the Spirit, and if you know Noah means Jesus, and if you know the clean and unclean beasts mean Jews and Gentiles, he, puts, he orders the words in such a way that you can read it. So that if you flip those words, if you were to take the word, let's, let's do that right now. I want to show you how this works. If you were to take the words, waters of the flood, and if we interpret that correctly, that's talking about the Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 3 says it's a picture of baptism, specifically of the Holy Spirit, because there's only one baptism, right? And so if, if you say that that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and if Noah is a picture of Jesus, his sons and his wives and his son wives with him, if that's us, like his family, right? Uh, and if the ark represents the body of Christ, then look at what you can do. God orders the words so that it tells the perfect uh, prophetic word concerning what Christ was about to accomplish for those that believe. Let's flip all the words into their correct translation, symbolic translation. And Jesus went in, and all of us with him, into the body of Christ because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You, you, you see that? Okay, let, let me say this again. Listen to last week's message. Every single word that I just flipped, I substantiated last week, okay? Uh, the only word that I didn't give you a specific verse for, it would take too long to explain more of this, was, was Noah. But clearly, if you know that the ark is a picture of the body of Christ, right, and you know that somebody built up the body of Christ, it, then, okay, we know who did that, right? So it's kind of easy to see who Noah is, first and foremost. If you were to also read Genesis chapter 5, which we didn't read and I will not read tonight either, Noah is prophesied to give rest to us. And there's a thing there where you can see that he's a symbol of Jesus. Well, furthermore, the same with it, Solomon. Remember, that Jesus called the son of David in the Bible. Solomon built the temple. And Solomon is a picture of Christ. Even in the Song of Solomon, he's a picture of Christ, right? And he built the temple. Well, you have this figure, namely Noah, in this account, who's building up an ark with many rooms. The ark is a picture of the body of Christ. So obviously, I think it's cl pretty clear who Noah is, right? Not to mention the fact that, like I said, there are, there's more details I could go into from Genesis chapter 5. But anyway, when you flip all those words, you can see that Jesus and all of us go into the body of Christ, into, the, into that one body, because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I think that's clear. And verse 8, clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls and everything that creeps upon the earth. Clean beasts and unclean beasts. That means this is not just reserved for the Jews. God prophesied in the Jews' own Bible. God prophesied that I, he would bring salvation to the Gentiles soon. And we live in that age in which salvation has been brought to us, the Gentiles, non-Jews or the quote-unquote unclean beasts, okay? Not that we're unclean, but it's just saying that, well, I'm not going to go into why that's right now because I'm going to rabbit trail too much right now. Uh, we were not a part of the covenant of God initially. Okay, we'll leave it at that. But notice it describes, it says, and beasts that are not clean of fowls and everything that creeps upon the earth. That's actually how... Peter saw a vision in Acts, right, which I just mentioned, and that's actually how he describes it. 
of fowls and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and four-footed beasts. That's what he saw that God gave him uh, that was a symbol of the Gentiles. Okay, So let's look at this real quick. Go to verse 7 one more time. It says that Noah went in, so obviously it's a symbol of Jesus and us, that are, we enter the body of Christ because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we, went, we were baptized into what? What does it say there? We were baptized into what? The ark, right? But what's that? We were baptized into the same body, right? As we said, ark means body. So we were baptized into the same body. This is very important. Jesus and us were baptized by the waters of the flood into the same body. Next verse. Clean and unclean beasts. Jew and Gentile. So what did that verse just say? That Christ and us were all baptized into the same body, both Jews and Gentiles. Right? Isn't that what that just said? If you flip all the words correctly, like we just did? Okay. Throw up now 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. So because of the waters of the flood, Noah and us were all baptized into the same ark, both clean and unclean beasts, right? Both Jews and Gentiles. Look at what 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and I'm gonna, you're going to see the parallel here. It says, for by one spirit, floodwaters, we are all baptized into one body, into one ark. Remember it said they, they went into the ark because of the waters of the flood? Well, here it says, by one spirit, we're all baptized into the one, in one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, clean or unclean beasts. This verse is the exact parallel to Genesis chapter 7. It's, it's like it literally is the same thing. If you just flip the words, if you flip all the symbolic words, you come up with 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Literally. Because you could say it the reverse way here too, right? You can say, for by the waters of the flood, we went into one ark, whether it be clean or unclean beasts. You see that? You just flipped it the other way and just used symbolic words. You see? That, that, that's why it's important to understand that symbolic words in the Bible have a definition and they mean, they have, a, they have a, a, a reality, a parallel to it, that you can just flip the words back and forth. It's not like a comparison, right? It's not like, well, this is kind of like this scenario. It's not, it's not a make, making a comparison. Like, we're kind of like unclean beasts. It's saying unclean beasts means Gentile. So every time you read unclean beasts, you can flip that, and it means Gentile. All right? So I just want to show you that. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 7. There's a lot to read here and a lot of really cool stuff that we could read. Let's read Genesis chapter 7, verse 12, and then we're going to skip a little bit here. Genesis chapter 7, verse 12. And it says, And the rain was upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. Well, what's, what's the rain? The rain is obviously the Holy Spirit. All right? The rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. In verse 13, In the self same day entered Noah. You see, again, it mentions the water and then Noah entering into the ark. Water first, then we enter the ark. Baptized in the Holy Spirit first, that's how we became a part of the body of Christ. We were baptized into the body. We were flooded into the ark. You see that? Water first, the flood, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, then entering the body, whether Jew or Gentile. Um, and Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, into the ark. Okay, let's go to verse 17. And again, I'm going to switch to the Young's Literal Translation here. Young's Literal Translation is a great translation to compare to. Uh, compare to. Young's literal, and we're going to go to verse 17. Young's literal just says certain words better. Um, King James says the word prevail, and Young's literal translates it correctly, mighty. So that's why I'm reading this translation. Verse 17 is, and the deluge, or the, the, or the deluge. I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, but we're going to call it the deluge for now, which just means flood. That, that's the same word for flood in the Young's literal. So it's, the flood is 40 days on the earth. And the waters multiply and lift up the ark, and it is raised from off the earth. Again, I believe that's our redemption from the earth. When we were baptized with the Holy Spirit, we're no longer part of the world. And the waters are mighty, and they multiply exceedingly upon the earth. And the ark goes, or that means the ark walks on the face of the water. I believe that's talking about walking by the Spirit. Um, in verse 19, and the waters have been very, very mighty on the earth. Uh, referring to the, the work of the Spirit of God through us. And covered, look at this, and covered are all the high mountains which are under the whole heaven. And this is really where I wanted to get to here. Look, look at this. This is what we pointed out last time. It says that when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, if you understand that mountains, as we went through last time, means heaven, high mountains means high heavens. That means where Jesus is. And it says that when you were baptized with the Holy Spirit, God put the high heavens inside of you. The mountains, it says, are covered. Now, I understand that physically speaking, 
the mountains being covered here is talking about all the mountains were covered with water, right? But notice he doesn't say the mountains are covered by water here. Because then that would, it would throw off the symbolism to say the mountains were covered by water. It just says they were covered. Is everyone seeing that? It just says they were covered. Why does God not say they were covered with water? Because the water represents the Holy Spirit. And right now, the high mountains, the high heavens are not covered by the Holy Spirit. They're covered by your body. We're going to get into this, okay? It says the high mountains are covered. Remember, we're reading this symbolically. We're not reading this literally. We're reading how it testifies of Christ symbolically, the way that Peter said that this was a symbol. That's how we're reading it, the same way Peter was. And so it says, and covered. So at the point of baptism, this whole thing is a picture of when, when the Spirit first indwelt you, right? When you became a part of the household of God. And at this point of baptism, it says that now all the high mountains are covered, and they're under the whole heavens. This is a very, very important point to make, which we, we also made last week as well. The high mountains are called the high mountains. And by that, obviously, I mean high heavens. Mountain means heaven, right? So the high mountains or the high heavens are obviously above all the heavens. I don't know where that means, but it's up there somewhere. The high heavens where God dwells are obviously the highest. That's why they're called that, the highest heaven. Again, mountains and hills are, are, are the symbolic word for heaven in the Bible. But there's different levels of the mountains. There's different levels of the heavens. God happens to live in the highest one, in which his will is done perfectly, right? The Bible says, let your will be done on earth the way it is in heaven. That's referring to the highest heaven. And so, the highest heaven is where God dwells. And this says that at the point of baptism, look what it says here. At the point of baptism, the high mountains, which obviously you can flip that word, right? If mountain means heaven, as we said last uh, service, you can flip that. All the high heavens, it says, are covered, and they're under the whole heavens. Let me ask you this question. What are the high heavens doing under the whole heavens? You see, you see where I'm going with this? What are they doing under the he whole heavens? The high heavens are above all the other heavens. This says that at the point of baptism, the high mountains, which is a reference to the high heavens where God dwells, are now under the whole heavens. They came down somehow. They were transferred down. And this says the high mountains are covered. Now, because we're reading this symbolically, it doesn't say what they're covered with yet. But this is a truth. At the point of baptism, the high heavens come down underneath all the heavens, or the whole heavens, it says, and they're covered up. And if you look at, let's go to uh, chapter 8, Genesis 8, verse 4. Genesis 8, verse 4. You can switch back to the King James if you want here. So back to King James, Genesis 8, 4. What do we have so far? At the point of baptism, this says, the high mountains are under the whole heavens, and they are covered up now. So this is what this means. At the point that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we will translate this, at the point at which you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, the high heavens came down somehow, and again, as I said before, what are they doing under all the heavens? The high mountains are above them typically, but at the point of baptism, they come low, and they're covered up. What are they covered up with? Genesis 8, 4 says, and the ark rested in the... What's the ark? The body of Christ. That's all of us. So you could say, and all of our bodies rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. We're reading this symbolically, remember. This says, at the point of baptism, the high heavens are now covered up with something. And it answers the question in verse 4 by saying it was the ark that rests upon the mountains. I keep saying this, but for people that are not used to hearing symbols, you must be constantly thinking, but the mountains were covered up with water. But, but it's, we're not reading the historical account. We're reading it symbolically. It's, we're reading it what each thing is symbolic of. So the words no longer mean what they meant before. Now they mean something on a completely different layer. There's different layers to it, right? There's the literal layer, and then there's what 1 Peter chapter 3 says, which it's a figure of. So when it says the high mountains are covered, true. Physically speaking, it just meant they were covered with water. I get that. But 
it doesn't say water. And when you read it symbolically, it says the high mountains, and we know that's symbolic of heaven. The water is, is, is a symbol of the Spirit. And it says that the, the, the uh, it doesn't say the mountains were covered with water. It said the mountains were covered. And in verse 4 here, it says the ark rested on the mountains. The ark is your body. Here's my point. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, as we said last, last week, Mount Zion, the high heavens, get transferred like this, down underneath the ark. Okay? Where did, it, where did it say the mountains are, which is heaven? Under the ark. The same way that we read, remember we read in Hebrews chapter 12, that it says that your spirit right now, inside of you, is called Mount Zion. Hebrews 12 says that. That means that there's a mountain inside of your body, because it says your spirit is referred to as Mount Zion, a part of Mount Zion. So this is what that means. God, by the Spirit coming from heaven down to you and indwelling you, the Spirit himself is what I'm actually referring to when I say that the high heavens came down and indwelt you. I'm talking about the Spirit. The Spirit is the image of heaven. Okay, the Spirit is the image of heaven. And God's Spirit, or you could say the image of the high mountains, came down and now lives in you. Okay? So... This is literally what happened at baptism. The high mountains were transferred now underneath the whole heavens and now live inside of you. Let me give you another, another, another really cool example of the high heavens. Um, uh, if, if you can take them quickly to, uh, to Luke 4, 5. Um, I gave all the verses last week. I just didn't give you this one, so I wanted to give you this one as an extra bonus. But like I said, the substantiation for what all these symbolic words mean is in the last message. But you can see the transfer. The high mountains are now, look, under all the heavens. They are the highest. But now the, now the high heavens have two locations. Above all the heavens and also under the whole heavens in you. Well, where does it say it's in us? It says it's under the ark. The mountains are under the ark. The ark rests on the mountains. Because remember, you're an ark resting on a mountain. You're a city on a hill. You're a man that builds his house upon a rock. Body on the heavens. Body on the heavens. House on a rock. City on a hill. Flesh upon Mount Zion, like Hebrews 12 says. There's a mountain in you. What does that mean? There's a high mountain in you. That means there's the high heavens in you. You have, you carry around with you the portable version of the high heavens. In all the glory of the high heavens in which God's will is done perfectly. Everything is perfect in the high heavens. And God has now perfected your spirit in the image of the high heavens. And that's why it says now at the point of baptism, the high mountains are now under the whole heavens and the ark is on top of it. Remember I said it was covered up? What, is the, what are the mountains covered up with for us as believers? Covered up with your body. With your ark. Resting upon it. Luke 4, 5. This here's an example of uh, where the devil brought Jesus when he was tempting him. Uh, into one of the levels of the higher heavens. Not where God, I don't believe where God is, but he brought him to a higher heaven. It says the devil taking Jesus, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I don't know that there are many physical mountains where you can see all the kingdoms of the world in one moment. Anyone know any mountains where you can see all the kingdoms of the world in one moment? If we, let's dwell on that for a second. You ever wondered? Because he's not referring to a physical mountain. He brought him to a certain levels of the heavens, and they looked down at the earth, and he said he tempted Jesus with giving him all the kingdoms of the earth. So I just want to give you another verse where uh, the word high mountain is used. Again, it says he brought him into a high mountain, or an high mountain. Uh, this is, I don't believe he was talking about the highest heaven, but one of the higher levels of the heavens where they could get a view of all of the, uh, all of the earth. Okay? All right. So that's just another, another thing here. So with all that said, right, we understand that there's a mountain underneath us. Let me show you one more thing from this, from this Noah timeline here. So now, what have we got? We've got the ark, the body of Christ, right? Noah, which the, the ark contains who? Noah and his family, just as it is today. The body of Christ contains Christ himself and all of us, his family. Uh, who are contained in the ark? Male and female, Jew and Gentile, right? In the ark. 
So the whole body of Christ now rests upon a mountain. That is a truth. And when you know what that means symbolically, you realize, wow, the ark is the body of Christ and mountain means heaven. That means I'm on top of heaven. And then guess what? That's why it opens up things to your understanding when you realize, again, city on a hill and all those verses that we went through. So the high heaven is inside of you. Here's how it works. When we say that you can enter heaven, it's true that when Jesus comes back, everybody will first be glorified fully like Jesus. This is for every believer, whether they're stubborn right now and don't want to learn you know, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, a quick pace or not. When Jesus comes back, everyone that's a legitimate believer will see Christ as he is and be like, oh, snap, I could have known that the whole time. And then everything that's in them will get revealed. They'll be glorified just like Jesus in the flesh, which, you, again, you don't have to wait for that day. But they'll be glorified in the flesh, and they will all ascend to where Jesus went. But you can go where Jesus went now. And how can I say that? Well, where Jesus went is inside of you. It's the same place. Think about this for a second. It's the same place. Where he went and ascended to this says that he put inside of you. Again, we gave a lot of verses last, you know, I keep remembering verses that I quoted last service, but we took like an hour just to go over those verses. So listen to the last message. But for those of us that understand what I was talking about last, last week, because again, I did give the substantiation, but where Jesus went, which is what? The high heavens. God now through baptism put inside of you. So it's a lot easier to go where Jesus went because it's right there in you. It's your portable high heavens inside of you. You always have a home right here. You carry it with you now. So you don't have to ascend to go into the high heavens anymore. What actually happens is, remember, again, I use this verse a lot, but I know it's just the easiest verse that is to explain to people how this process works. Um, out, remember, out of your belly will flow forth rivers of living water. This is why the, the picture here, out of your belly will flow forth rivers of living water, referring to the spirit that God gave us. That's how you enter the high heavens. God puts the high heavens in you, and then out, where, where are the high heavens? Where are the high mountains? Under the ark, right? Okay, so they're under the ark, but guess what happens later on in, in, this, in this passage? The mountains are under the ark. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 8. Verse 5, Genesis 8, 5. What happens is the way that you can enter the high heavens is that God puts the high heavens in you and then the high heavens manifest and give life to your body. You hearing that? What, if you have heaven inside of you and that manifests and swallows up your body or, or, or even, even, even before that, when it manifests and gives to your body, like the Bible says that the Holy Spirit inside of us will give life to our mortal bodies. What is that? That's the spirit or the high mountains inside of you where Jesus went, inside of you. The image of where Jesus went is put inside of you. That manifests and all that life comes out of you and gives to your body. And it's like your body feeds from that river that's manifesting from you, right? The way that John 7 says, that out of your belly will flow forth rivers of living water, right? Well, guess what it says? It says that uh, the waters decreased continually until the 10th month and the 10th month uh, uh, on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen or manifest. So this depicts the manifestation of the mountains in you, okay? The tops of the mountains here is actually uh, 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 the heads of the mountains, and I don't have time to go, with, go through that. But let's just look at the, it says, the mountains are seen. So this is the beginning of, so the, so the mountains are under the ark, the mountains are under the ark, and then the mountains are seen. That means they manifest. They're inside of you, and then the high heavens manifest through you, to your body. Let's look at Verse 15 now. It says, and then God spake unto Noah. Look at this. Verse 16. Go forth of the ark. Look at this. Go forth of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your, and your sons' wives with you. Bring forth with you every living thing. Just so you know, that word living thing is only one word in the Hebrew. It's translated living thing because they're trying to make it make sense with the account. But it's just the word life. It's just one word, and it's just the word life. So that would be translated better this way. Bring forth with you all life that is with you. You see that? Of all flesh, both fowl and of the cattle and of every creeping thing. Again, it goes into all that. And then it says, and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. 
You see this? The mountain goes under the ark, and then God says, now come forth from the ark. All that is, all life that is with you, come forth from the ark. What do you think that is? Out of your belly now. That's the principle, right? Like John, like John 4 says, Jesus says in John 4, the way the Holy Spirit works is this. Pay close attention to this. In the, John 4, Jesus says the way the Holy Spirit works is this. First you drink in the water. The water goes in you. You drink in the water. And then it says with time, and obviously our learning, it says it will become in you a fountain of water springing up unto everlasting life. What does that mean? First you get the Holy Spirit inside of you, and then the Holy Spirit comes out. You could say, first the mountain goes under the ark, and then God says, now go forth from the ark and be fruitful. All life that is with you. You seeing the symbolism? It's referring to the fact, this is how you enter heaven where Jesus went. You don't have to wait for another day. You already have where Jesus went inside of you. In fact, hopefully next week, I'm going to start going into... We're going over the symbols right now. Jesus actually says this plainly in John chapter 14. That where I am, you may be also. But you see, that's a reality for us now. You have where he is right now inside of you. And if you have where he is inside of you, and if what's inside of the ark can go forth from the ark and give life to your mortal body, then where is your body? Your body has just entered the high heavens. Your spirit, the Bible says, is already a part of Mount Zion. That's a fact. The Bible says that in Hebrews chapter 12, your, 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 your uh, spirit is already a part of the mountain. But your body can also, the body, the sheep, the sheep can enter the upper fold where Jesus went. The congregation of Israel can enter where their priest went into the holiest. And we have boldness to enter into the high heavens or the holiest where our priest went. How do you do that? The holiest is in you. The upper fold is inside of you. And it can manifest to your body, and that's how your body, the sheep, enters the upper fold. Because we said that, right? That I, won't, I won't flip the, the uh, dry erase board around. But that the sheep, that's how the sheep enter the upper fold, right? They enter through the door. Well, through Jesus' death, you can enter the high heavens. But the way that we enter the high heavens is, we saw, right? The high mountains get covered up underneath the ark, and then they go forth from the ark and bear fruit all life that is with you. That's how that works. Let me read you another verse here. And I am going to switch this actually back around. See, this is why what, what I, I did, I, I, uh, I drew a sheep there. There's a reason why I put the sheep on its back because it's reminiscent of the temple, just so you know. So the sheep looks like the temple, which we probably won't get to tonight. Um, it's true the sheep can enter the upper fold, but you're entering what's underneath you. You see? You, when you, when you, if you want to go where Jesus went, you just don't have to go where Jesus went in the same direction. It's true, we both go through the same door, I understand that. But Jesus ascended and went to the high heavens, but you can go down. You enter in what's underneath you. You see, the ark, when the ark tastes, partakes, receives of the high mountains, it's underneath it. So this is how it works. God feeds you. God feeds you with the high mountains that are underneath you. The mountains are, you know, I, I got to flip the thing around again to show you this. The mountains are underneath you. The Bible says, then out of your belly will flow forth rivers of living water. And that river feeds then your body with the life or the, you could say the high mountains that are inside of you. This is how it works. It's going to take me a little bit to, to explain this, the verses for this. But this diagram here is a good representation of how this works. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 12. Okay. Okay. Ezekiel 34, 12 says, you'll notice the sheep shepherd um, symbolism here. Similar to, uh, remember John 10, the sheep and the shepherd, right? And the shepherd goes to the fold and the sheep follow him and all that, right? Same symbolism here. And look what it says. He says, as a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So it's talking about the shepherd and the sheep, right? Let's skip to verse 13 for the sake of time. 
And I will bring them out of the people and gather them from the countries. Doesn't this sound like, remember John 10? It said that he brings his sheep out of the folds. Remember that? In John 10, it says he brings his sheep out of the folds and into the upper fold and gives them pasture. That's what John 10 says. This says the shepherd brings his sheep out from among the people or out of the folds of the earth and brings them to their own land. And look at, look at this. In John 10, pay, pay close attention to me uh, on, on this, okay? Because I just don't want anyone to miss this. In John, look at the parallel here. In John 10, he says, I'm going to bring them out. It says that Jesus, it says, it says when Jesus brings his sheep out, he goes before them. And he's referring to bringing them out of the world or the folds of the world, the nations, okay? So Jesus brings his sheep out. And it says that when they go through the door, they are saved and they find pasture. But specifically, we saw, right, that the door leads to the upper fold. Remember we said this? The sheep come out of the nations of the world. They go through the door, that is Christ's sufferings, and they enter what? What is it that we receive through Christ's sufferings? The upper fold, right? That you could say uh, heaven. Through Jesus' sufferings, we get to enter the things of heaven. Here, it doesn't say it the same way. Instead of saying that Jesus, the shepherd, brings his sheep out through the door and en they enter the upper fold or heaven, here it says that he brings them out from the people and gathers them from the countries. That's our redemption from this earth. Through the sufferings of Jesus, we've been redeemed from this earth. The sheep have been brought out from among the peoples, and the, and the shepherd feeds them upon the mountains, upon the mountains. Let me just, let me just stop there. You see, you are being brought to an upper fold, but you're being brought, in other words, you are being brought into heaven, but you're being brought into the mountain that you are upon. He feeds you with the mountain that you are upon. You see that? He brings them out of the people. Again, this is like exactly the same thing as, as uh, John 10, except for it, it's more detailed. Instead of John 10, 10 saying he brings them out from the nations or the folds and brings them into the upper fold, it says he brings them out from the people and feeds them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers. Does this look reminiscent of anything? Upon the mountains of Israel, by the rivers, and in verse 14, it says he will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. Upon the high mountains. That means you are on top of the high heavens. Again, you see that? The same thing that it said in the, in, in, in the account of Noah that we have through baptism, that we are now upon the high mountains. Remember that? This says that we will feed upon the high mountains. And in verse, uh, yeah, verse 14, let's keep reading. And they shall lie in a good fold. They shall lie down in a good fold and in fat pasture. They shall feed upon the mountains, on top of the mountains of Israel. And it will stop there. This concept of feeding on top, feeding upon the mountains of Israel, what it's saying is this, all right? Clearly, we are feeding on pasture. Pasture, just so you know, if you want the definition of the word, I don't know the exact definition of the word pasture, but I do know the word pasture is used as the, uh, like it's used as the opposite of withering away, okay? I'll tell you that much. So I, I have a hunch that it means life. Or, or that it means uh, freshness or like something to do with life, okay? So uh, it, it, it's used, again, grass or something that's green is used as the opposite of withering. For instance, in, in Psalms chapter 1, it says that our leaf shall stay green and uh, will not wither. Stay green and will not wither. And the Bible says that we are feeding upon green pasture, okay? So you can see as the word green is used the opposite of withering away or fading away. So that's why I have a hunch that Pasture is referring to life or eternal life in some way, which would make sense, right? Jesus says that from inside of you, his, he'd put his spirit in you, and then that spirit would manifest to you, giving life to your flesh. Here, the way it's referring to is this. It says that there's a mountain inside of you. We've established that. You are upon the mountain. But notice it says you are by a river. Why does it say you're by a river? We know what that river represents, right? The Holy Spirit, correct? Correct. Uh, just like John 7 says, that the Holy Spirit is like rivers of living water. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is this river, but why does it say you're by a river? You notice that? You're on a mountain, 
but by a river. It doesn't say the river is in you. You're next to the river, right? So like the river is outside of you. You, you, you seeing that? So you're on top of a mountain, so that means I'm on top of heaven, but I'm next to the river. I'm by the river. You'll even notice in Psalm 23, it says, he leads me beside still waters, or that's better, trend, waters of rest. He leads me beside still waters, beside waters of rest. Why is it that you'll find this terminology that this is true, that this concept of being on a mountain next to a river, feeding on pasture, is a common symbol throughout the whole Bible. And stay with me. This is a common symbol throughout the entire Bible, being, watch, on top of a mountain, by a river, feeding on pasture. Also, lying down. Lying down is also an important fourth one, but we're, that's not relevant to this message. Okay? So, on top, we're on top of a mountain from this. We're by a river, and we're feeding on pasture. I'm going to submit this to you, and I, we'll, we'll talk about this further. I'll, 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 we're on our way to wrapping up tonight, but we'll finish this in another message. Okay? Look at this symbolism. I just really want to finish this up if I can tonight. On a mountain, by a river, feeding on pasture. This is what I'm going to, information I'm going to submit to you as the interpretation of this, and then I will show you more. Look at this. Being upon a mountain is referring to, obviously, heaven being inside of you. Next to a river is because the river, when the Holy Spirit's called a river, a river is referring to something that's coming up out of the earth. A fountain or a river in the Bible, in some way, I, 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 maybe there's more details to see, but a fountain or a river is not referring to just the Holy Spirit in general but the Holy Spirit manifesting. This is why you are always beside a river, not upon a river. You know, you see the terminology here? It wouldn't be accurate to say you're upon a river because the Holy Spirit manifesting would be next to you. You understand? It, it, it's, it's outside of you, I should say. When the Holy Spirit manifests, he's not in you anymore. He's brought forth from the ark and gives life to your mortal body. So it's not accurate to say you're upon a river, you're on the high mountains, and then that gets transferred to your body, and that's the Holy Spirit being a river. He's manifesting, like for instance, the fountains of the great deep, or, or the, even under the earth right now. Hell is referred to a place of floods and rivers, just so you know, the place under the earth. And rivers is used as something that like manifests from up out of the earth. That's how it's, it's used in the Bible. Don't know the definition specifically, but that's how it's used. So this is the information I'm submitting to you right now. This is how it works. Mountain, high heavens, inside of you. It was up here. Then through baptism, now it's permanently in your body, on, in, inside the ark. But what happens is the Holy Spirit doesn't stay in here. The high mountains don't stay in here. Out of your belly flow forth rivers of living water. That's the Holy Spirit manifesting and then feeds your body with pasture. So what do you see this man here? And he's got some broad shoulders, right? I had to fit the whole, the whole picture in there. But this guy here, right? This human body, what is he right now? You see, because clearly we understand from John 4, the Holy Spirit goes in you first, and then through righteousness, which is this door. Because righteousness is how you're able to receive from God. So you could say this. This man is a sheep. Just so you know, because uh, uh, if you want the verses later, remind me, I'll give them. The Bible says that God's sheep are men. Or the word men means flesh. So you know the word sheep means flesh. This man is a sheep on top of a mountain, next to a river, feeding on pasture. Or you could say, this is flesh upon the high heavens with the Holy Spirit manifesting outside of him and feeding his body with life. Everyone seeing that? Let, let me bring you to Isaiah 55 real quick. This concept of feeding from the river, like the river feeding you, is in the Bible, again, I have a lot of verses for this, but this is a clear one. You, you, you'll be really excited to see this. Look at this. In Isaiah 55, verse 1, it says, look at this, it says, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Isaiah 55, 1. Everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come you buy and eat. You see that? Eat from the waters. Again, another point of clarification here that I'm sure all of us need. You don't typically eat water. Right? If you want food, do you typically go to a river? No. But this river feeds you. Notice they're always, the sheep are always feeding by a river. Feeding by a river on top of a mountain. This is referring to the Holy Spirit. And it says, come to the waters, buy and eat. And look, it says you can buy wine and milk from the river. 
In other words, the river manifests, and he's saying the river, when it manifests from you, will give you wine and milk. Wine here is referring to rest. Wine doesn't mean rest. Just, you know, mine, wine means thoughtless, thoughtless, okay? But it can imply rest. And it's talking about rest, and milk is, I'm uh, pretty sure, referring to righteousness, okay? Uh, milk means, uh, we're not getting into that right now. Let's just, just take my word for it, okay? Wine and milk, symbolic words also. He gives you rest and righteousness, Peace and right, righteousness, peace, right? Enjoy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace. You could say uh, uh, milk and wine and enjoy in the Holy Ghost, right? That, that, or joy in, in, in the water, in the river, right? That, that's what this is saying. So you got righteousness and peace and joy from, from the water. That's what the, that's what the Holy Spirit uh, uh, produces through you. So this concept of, of coming to the waters, drinking in the waters, and it manifesting through you, and feeding your body with, here it says wine and milk, not pasture. But you can see clearly that this concept of feeding from the river is in the Bible. Okay? Notice here how it says the Holy Spirit as a river or as the waters. When he manifests, he produces wine. Right? This is like when Jesus put water in the vessels. Also a symbol. Remember at the wedding at Cana? Uh, he sees empty vessels. That's us before we get saved. And uh, he says, fill them up with water. So we filled him up with water. We got filled with the Holy Spirit, right? That's not talking about a second occurrence. That's the first time you got filled with the Holy Spirit, right? He's indwelling you now. And then Jesus said, draw out now. Or you could say, come forth from the ark. And guess what he did? They drew out. And what did it become when he drew out? Wine. It was water when it went in, but wine when it came out. It's water when you drink of it, but what can you can eat from the water. And it says, wine and milk it will give you. You feed the manifest, when Jesus manifests, when Jesus manifests to your body, it's called your body eating from the Holy Spirit. For instance, again, water goes in the vessels as the Holy Spirit going in the vessels, and, and when the Holy Spirit manifests, you get wine from it or rest from it. Is everyone following me so far? Is this, is this, is this not like a little too much or it, it, it's mostly good? I guess if it's too much, it doesn't matter. You've got to listen to it again because I'm already in the middle of it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's just slather on another layer here, just for further confirmation. This is why when Jesus was born of Mary, or like, in other words, the Holy Spirit manifesting out of us, the same way we have Jesus inside of us now, and then he can manifest through us, he was born in a feeding trough. The word manger in the Bible means feeding trough. You see? Jesus gets birthed through us, and that's called our, us feeding. You feed on what you birth. You see? The river comes out, and you get to eat from the waters. This is why it's referred to as a mountain in us, waters next to us, feeding on pasture. Here, it doesn't say all of that. It just says the water, obviously, when it manifests through you, it feeds you. You can eat from it. The same way that when Jesus manifests through Mary, when he was birthed, the same way that we give birth to Jesus, he was born a feeding trough. In other words, he was a meal, feeding, food for Mary, you could say, symbolically. Food for Mary when he was born. The Holy Spirit feeds your body with pasture when he manifests. The Holy Spirit manifesting is what? A river. So the Holy Spirit's inside of you when he manifests or when he pours forth out of your belly like rivers of living water, he feeds you. When Jesus poured forth out of the belly of Mary like rivers of living water, you could say symbolically, it was for food, to feed her. Mary was like a sheep. Look at this. Mary was like a sheep resting upon Jesus himself, the high heavens. And when Jesus was born, or in other words, when the river came forth out of the belly of Mary, it was to feed her. He was born a feeding trough. All these symbols, this is a common symbol through the whole Bible. When I draw this, again, not my slant. The Lord leads us into the high heavens. But how does he do that? How can we follow Jesus where he went? Where Jesus went is right inside of you. So that where he is, you can be also if you're willing to learn and therefore enter what's on the inside of you. When we talk about entering what's on the inside of us, it's actually that what's inside of us gets manifest to our body and comes upon our body now. See, God's in us, but when he manifests, we are in God. It comes upon us. Like the apostles in the book of Acts, it says great grace was upon them all. That means not just that it was in them, it was upon them. You see, we're upon the mountains right now. But when the mountains comes out and feeds us with its life, it's on us. So that means what? That means we're in the high heavens then. You see that? High heavens in you, but you can be in the high heavens if you want. 
You know how you do that? You learn from Jesus. And as you learn and acknowledge every good thing that's in you for Christ Jesus' sake, that becomes effectual. It births out of you. And like Jesus in the feeding trough, it births out of you and feeds your body with life. And now the high mountains are upon you. A really cool point with this, obviously we've been referring to, right, that we're called God's house. Why are we called God's house right now? Because God's in us, right? Everyone agree with that? We're called God's house because God is inside of us. But, you know, if you read the book of Revelation, it's pretty interesting. In the book of Revelation, when all the things, obviously in the book of Revelation is referring to the resurrection age, when everything inside of us is manifest fully, well, guess what? When everything inside of us is manifest fully in the book of Revelation for every single believer, it says that God is our tabernacle. What does that mean? We're God's tabernacle because he lives in us. When God's your tabernacle, it means he's upon you. You're in him. You see, it, you, you're in the high mountains. The high mountains are in you now, but they can come forth. And the Bible says that God is its tabernacle, it says in the book of Revelation. You are God's tabernacle, but when God manifests out of you, now he's your tabernacle. Now you're in him. That's the whole point of God having put the high heavens inside of you, is so that they could manifest and come upon you, so that where Christ is, there you may be also, while walking this earth. You can walk on this earth and be in the high heavens. You can walk on this earth. You've got the high heavens in you already, but you can enter the holiest. You can enter the high heavens. These things can come forth from you, and you can now be in the high heavens. And this concept, that's what, that's what this concept is referring to uh, uh, in Ezekiel 34. And I, I'm, I'm wrapping up right here. In Ezekiel 34, it says, upon a mountain, by a river, feeding on pasture. That's how that works. I would like to leave you with one more passage here, if I can, though. You can read Psalm 23 on your own time. Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by the still waters. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. <laughs> right? You're, you're on top of a mountain, by a river, feeding on pasture. And how do you receive of these things? You receive through righteousness, through the path of righteousness. And righteousness for his name's sake, mind you. Not righteousness for your work's sake. Righteousness because of who he is, not because of who you are. Um, if you want to jot another verse down, Revelation 7, verse 17. Revelation 7, verse 17. He confirms what I'm saying here uh, by saying that it says, The Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto fountains of waters. In other words, another verse explaining that we are fed by the fountains of water. It says, He will feed us and lead us unto fountains of water. Another verse, if you want to read, I'm not going to read this, Isaiah 49, verse 9 through 11. You can read that on your own time. Isaiah 49, verse 9 through 11, it just says the exact same thing. Upon a mountain, uh, by uh, springs of water. It says the same thing again. I might as well throw this one out. Isaiah 41, verse 18, that's another one. Only that one says that the high, high places are actually in the valley now. Valley would mean under the earth. And the high places are now in the valley. That's Isaiah 41, 18. All righty. Last passage. If, if you guys could just stay with me for the last passage, it, it, it'll, it'll be worth it. I'm not even, to be honest, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not even going to read this. I am just going to... I'm going to explain it, and I'll, I'll show you where the verse is. And here's where we'll end, okay? Uh, everyone's been paying very close attention, but just stay with me on this last thing, right? It's, just, it's worth getting this in. So... Uh, the temple, just so you know, in the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, he sees the exact same thing with the temple. And the temple is obviously, undoubtedly, a picture of the church, the temple that Solomon built. Well, Ezekiel sees a vision of it. So it's not the actual temple. He, it, it's in a vision. And he sees the temple, and this is what he sees. The temple, as we've said in the past, I'll say it for those who already know this, looks like a woman lying on her back. We've been through that a million times, right? So I'll just throw that out there. Looks like a woman lying down. Or you could say, like a sheep lying down, right? Like, like I drew over there. Here's what he sees. The, the two pillars, right, are like the legs of the temple, and we know there's a door between the two pillars, which is, again, like the birth canal. And what, this, what Ezekiel sees is a river coming forth out of the temple. <laughs> a river coming forth from the door of the temple, right? I mean, just look a little reminiscent of what we've explained. He sees this. A river coming out from under the threshold of the door of the temple. And guess what he sees? On either side of the river, fruitful trees. So he doesn't see pasture. But he sees trees on I, lining either side of the river. 
So again, looking a little familiar. And again, undoubtedly, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the temple that Solomon built is a picture of the church, the household of God. And the river coming forth from it is clearly from John, John chapter 7, the Holy Spirit. And this concept of the water feeding us is clear from Isaiah 55. That the water, you can eat from the waters, right? And you know what it says about the trees that are, uh, throw up Ezekiel, uh, 40, Ezekiel 47, verse 7. Ezekiel 47, verse 7. That's just the verse where it explains that there's trees on either side, fruitful trees on either side of the river. So clearly this is like the fruit of the Spirit, the, 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 the food that the Holy Spirit gives us. And it says, Now when I, when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and on the other. You see that? And look at verse 12. I'm, I'm summarizing this. If you want a full teaching on this whole vision, get the nations that are saved message online. The nations that are saved. I, I go in detail through the entire thing. Whoa, okay, that's a big verse. <laughs> let's, let's hone in here. Look at what it says. Look at what it says. Temple, river coming out of the temple. Trees on either side. What are the trees for? It says, and they shall grow all trees for meat. Can you switch to the New King James Version? Meat in the King James means food. And they shall grow all trees for meat. I don't know if this says food. Yeah, see, trees used for food. He says it toward the end, too. Their fruit of the trees will be for food, and their leaves for medicine. If the river is the Holy Spirit, and we're the temple, mind you, the temple has gold in it. You could say the high heavens. The temple is lined with gold only on the inside. Now, outside, it's stone. Inside, it's gold. Gold inside manifesting by a river outside of it. And the river produces trees good for food and medicine. Seeing something here, that's how that works. This is the reason why the Bible refers to you as a sheep upon a mountain, very important terms, on a mountain because the mountain's underneath you, Mount Zion is inside of you, next to a river, because you're not on the river, because the river is manifesting from you. Because what do you see? Even the temple. The, if I'm the temple, here, the river's flowing out from me. Am I on the river, or am I next to the river? I'm next to the river. And the river is outside of me. Why? Because it's manifesting from me, giving food and medicine to my body, and to the bodies of people that I come in contact with. And everywhere where the river goes shall live. That's what this chapter says. And we're done right there. There, there, there's, there, there, I, I want to make sure that this is like, what I'm trying to do, obviously, with these teachings is I'm not trying to like just do a teaching. I'm trying to exhaust the, 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 the things the Lord's taught me so that at least the information is available. Okay, so even if it's a little bit too much for a particular service, which I don't think it is, listen to these things again. All right? Listen to them again. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, so much for everything you've shown us, Lord. Thank you for feeding us by your river, feeding us by your spirit, Lord. And thank you so much, Jesus that we carry around with us the high heavens. Thank you so much, Jesus, for that. We are sheep upon the high mountains, and we can enter and receive of where you went, Jesus, because where you went is inside of us right now. Thank you so much, Jesus, for that. We praise you. We give you all the glory, Father. I pray that, you know, we, we talk so, so many times, Lord, about uh, the fact that, um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Prusi sibri kultushnizi amba brakostoli dianti. Sembu brokostili aja brakostatia. Boldly feth no shumbre kostumbre kultisnisi ai. Se brokos, sem broko dinchni prekostu brak. Tembo brakal stal braka shanis te grenko to shnishiai. Fame brakal dav nifi fit di shifi onko on bronko noste. Lamb of God, zempul la brakal stushti brinkal stuli am brankal daj nightly. Vent la fantasi vrinkal disti brokal stol brandi. 
a light of God. Zempel tash nasha, zempel stulia in. Let lot dish ni ambro kotosh nisia. Sembo broko silia, braka stanikrea. Vrandi al tash nasha, vrako stubriko stumbiai. Idinch ni akrakasta. Thank you for the gift of God in us, Lord. Thank you for your spirit, Lord, poured out on us. Thank you, Jesus, for the spirit that's been poured out on us. Thank you for the gift of God in us. Thank you, Lord. Healing. Thank you, Jesus. Healing. Thank you, Jesus. From the spirit inside of us. Healing. Thank you, Jesus. For healing to our bodies. Thank you, Jesus. Because the gift of God is inside of us. His spirit is for our healing. Thank you, Jesus. Brandash nasha labristos to brigadish niala grakal tashnoshish. Give me power, Papa, to heal people. Thank you, Jesus. The love of God working through me to heal people. To work through me to heal people. Give me power, Papa, to heal people. Thank you, Jesus. Lift me up, Papa, and show me Tishna Dambrokostilia. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Give me power to heal people, Lord. Produce in me power to heal people. God's giving power to heal people right now. Boom. Thank you, Jesus. Saber it from the world. Thank you, Jesus. The boom. Thank you, Jesus. Separate from the world. Power to heal people. Boom. Thank you, Jesus. Cover you right now in Jesus' name. Boom. Thank you, Jesus. Covered you right now in Jesus' name. Boom. Thank you, Jesus, for the separation from the world. Thank you, Jesus. Love of God come upon you. Thank you, Jesus. Super abundance. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let it go. Thank you, Jesus. Boom. Let it go. Separate from the world now. Separated from the world now. Thank you, Jesus. Boom. Thank you, Jesus, for the love of God being shed abroad. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Healing from us now. Thank you, Jesus, right now. Everlasting healing. Thank you, Jesus, for that. The cooperation. We need to cooperate. Let's cooperate, though. Let's cooperate. Thank you, Jesus. How do you cooperate with Jesus? Believe me. Thank you, Jesus. Believe me. Thank you, Jesus. Cooperate. Let's cooperate now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Turn your heart to Jesus right now and thank him for what he's given you. He's given you so much. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've given us. Let's cooperate with the Lord by believing him. Thank you, Jesus. Boom. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit of holiness given us. Thank you, Lord. Separate from the world, we are right now in Jesus' name. We're cooperating with the spirit. Let's look to Jesus right now. Thank Jesus for what he's already given you. Thank you, Lord. Not what he's giving you tonight. Thank you, Lord. Let's thank Jesus for what he's already given us. Not what he's giving you tonight. Thank you, Lord. What he's already given you. Boom, it's yours in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your power inside of us. And we look forward, Lord, to more and more manifest through us as we learn you more and more. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you for all these things, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Father. Thank you for your spirit that gives life to us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Just a little, a little thought, um, just in general. Um, you know, I know a lot of us know this already, but just, just figured I'd mention just for even people listening to this, maybe even later. Um, I don't, I don't like make stuff up and it's just, it's sometimes, let me just say this, the most spiritual thing you can do is not fake spirituality. Like just don't do it. If the Lord doesn't do it, then just don't. Just, it never happens. Like, e even like with prophecy and the gifts of the Spirit and things like that, those are things that I can't do, right? So I can believe the Lord by listening to him. That, like, I can do that. So 
don't try. Like, I, I, you know, I don't know how else to say it. Listen to the Lord. Make sure that you're, you're, as it was even just said, cooperating with the Lord. But, like, sometimes we, 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 we like, you'll go to churches and they're like, they're just saying things to sound spiritual and like almost like stir something up or whatever. But, like, as far as gifts of the Spirit are concerned, it, it, it's, that's not something that you can do. It's something you have, though. So the, the way that that works is you have to acknowledge the good that's in you, and then it becomes effectual, right? So acknowledge the good that's in you. Like, to, to try to make it effectual or to try to fake that is, is not necessary. You know, like, if, if, if I go until Jesus comes back without some, like, apparent manifestation, um, I'm not saying that's the will of God. I'm just saying it's, it, it would not be appropriate at any point in time to just try to fake stuff. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's, it's not worth doing that. Um, we can't bear fruit. And by fruit, obviously, I mean like the strength of God being produced through us. We can't bear that ourselves. So just know that it's the will of God for you and, and just continue to believe those things. God will manifest those things through you. You know what I mean? It, it, it gives to the spirit and things like that. It's just not. So many people fake stuff and it's just. Like, you notice they only, again, I've said this before, but you notice they only fake the stuff that is most easily faked. Like, they don't, they just fake, like, speaking in other tongues, or they'll fake certain things, or even, like, certain forms of prophecy, like, vague prophecy. But they're never going to, like, fake raising the dead. You know, it's, because it's like they know the things that are beyond their limitations, and then they know the things that they can, people have even said, oh, but, you know, praying in the Spirit or praying in other tongues is something that you can just do. It's the only gift that you can do just voluntarily. No. <laughs> When do I pray in other tongues? Whenever I feel like it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I listen to the Lord. And when, as I'm listening to the Lord, if I feel like it, then there it goes. You know, it's not, it's, it's, if you feel like it, then go ahead and pray, you know? And I think that would go for anybody. Uh, that's God's will, just so you know, that God manifests things through you. And it says, these signs will follow those who believe. And one of those signs that follows who believe is that they'll speak in other languages. And so, so believe. You know, I don't know what else to say. It didn't say these signs will follow those who, like, try to do it and fake it. Like, it, it's not how it works. Believe. If you, as you believe, these things are manifest through you. And if you want something to be manifest through you, tell the Lord. Say, you know what, Lord, I'll cast this on you. Say, Lord, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do this myself, Lord. This is silly. This is something the Holy Spirit manifests, and, and I would like to do this, or I would like this to be manifest, and, and cast that on the Lord, and, and continue to believe the Lord. You know, that, that's how it works. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reformed Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this unpopular message to the world. If you'd like to support Reform Church, you can do so at reforminus.com give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reforminus.com.